Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Everybody knows about the, the credit bubble in China. A lot of people say it's not a bubble. Other people say it's a massive bubble ready to break at any moment. Either way, there's a lot of pressure on China to rebalance its economy. They have a very powerful beggar-thy-neighbor export policy, which all of Asia generally does by suppressing their currency. They don't have much of a domestic market. Um, the domestic market is growing and growing fast, but the relative size of the domestic market just can't take the massive amount of final goods that China produces, and that's the problem. You need, we need the, a stronger dollar to try and start really some, some rebalancing here in China. It really does take, it would help to take the pressure off of China and have them start to look the other way. Um, there's a lot of implications of this, and as Steve knows, we've done a complete uh, webinar on this whole interrelationship between China and the U.S. and its currency policy and its current account, and I'll get to some of that. But this is really the situation in the world that, that at the moment, besides the, the Eurozone imploding, providing global systemic risk, this China-U.S. relationship, uh, as we know, is critical in the world. China is the growing dominant power out there that's pulling the world along. We're starting to see a little bit of slowdown in China. But we're also, what we're also seeing is China still digging in its heels on the currency, even though it's said it's going to cut its peg to the dollar. They're, going to do, they're not going to let the currency run much at all. It's going to be very, very slowly. They're also getting tighter and tighter on U.S. businesses. You may have seen the, the flap uh, with the German industrialists just yesterday, I think just this morning, hit the papers, or yesterday, excuse me. Um, that's a big deal. So there's some real pressures growing against China um, about their policy forcing Western companies um, to basically hand over all the technology and, and the like. And in a world where global demand is declining and China needs co all the cooperation from the West that they can to push those final good exports out, here's an area that um, still we think is a major, major risk factor in the world. A rising U.S. dollar here will tend to take the pressure off of China and, and reduce that bubble uh, in a big way. And if you think of it from, a, from the standpoint, a rising U.S. dollar – on a relative basis, empowers the U.S. consumer and increases its purchasing power, which is something China needs in a big way because the U.S. consumer is still the, the, you know, the big buyer of China's exports, and they need the U.S. consumer to be in the game. And this is where it kind of all interrelates in here, that all of these things kind of self-reinforce, especially the real economy improvement and getting money into the real economy and small businesses creating jobs. Um, and also creating some consumer demand or, or keeping consumer demand alive goes a long way to rebalancing this China situation. And the fourth factor was capital, U.S. capital investment. The improvement in the U.S. current account, which we'll get to in a minute, is a function uh, to a degree of, of a lot of U.S. savings, um, or I should say paying those that have the ability to save. But either way, a lot of the consumers aren't spending the money they did before, whether they're saving or paying down debt, private deleveraging the world. If, if this continues, we're going to have a pool of private capital out there that's going to tend to denude some of this lack of money flow back into the U.S. if that were to be the case. But the flip side of this is also, if you look at the U.S. and the real economy starts to gen, gen up and the U.S. dollar starts to move in the right direction, um, you'd, have an, you'd have a view that the U.S. Um, assets look very, very cheap from a foreign investor given what's happened to the U.S. dollar over the last seven years. So you'd see, again, that self-reinforcing process of very cheap assets with a rising currency. It would tend to bring international money in to get position for the currency to continue to rise, buy in cheap assets, and again, tend to, to reinforce that process. So all this is kind of a self-reinforcing circle in these four major, um, major macro themes, and that, that's, how, that's why we've laid it out that way. As I said, some may be in trouble. And these are the five we refer to as the five thematic rationales here to support those, made, those four big global macro themes. Number one, we're seeing improvement in the current account deficit. And I have slides for each one of these, so I'll go through this quickly and talk more about it when we get to the slides. Uh, Mr. Triffin, phone your office. This is re just refers to this idea of Triffin's dilemma. Um, and I won't go into this too much, but Triffin was an economist back in the 50s, and he said once the U.S. dollar becomes the world reserve currency, it's, 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 it can't avoid running uh, wide current account deficits because it has to lubricate the globe with its currency instead of gold. 
Number two, improving yield differential. We expected the Fed, um, again, looking back at this point here, we expected a hike in interest rates or at least taking some of this money away so we could try and f so in, in an effort to force some of that money into the real economy. We haven't seen that, and here's a part of our story that, that may be breaking down a little, um, but it, it isn't over yet. So improving yield differential in the U.S. dollar, meaning the Fed would hike uh, faster than Europe and Japan, um, it's still in play, but again, the yield differentials in the U for the U.S. dollar are actually um, going a bit negative again, but, but we'll talk about that. Foreign direct investment, um, just talked about that a bit, just asset purchases on the cheap, um, and just gross fixed, ass, fixed investment in the U.S. has fallen dramatically since the credit crunch. We think that rebuild um, with a rising dollar is self-reinforcing, we talked about a bit. Risk, the world reserve currency really um, tends to do well on risk, and the world reserve currency, by, by the nature of it being the world reserve currency, it has the deepest capital markets in the world, and that's why it does so well on risk. People run to the, to the treasury markets to hide big, big, deep capital, and the dollar gets a, gets a risk bid um, in spite of whatever's going on in the U.S. Um, that's a factor that's always been supported for the world reserve currency and especially continues to be in this environment, especially with the concern going on in the eurozone. Uh, the valuation squeeze. This goes to the again a little bit about you know what's going on in Europe. They need a lower currency. In effect, the two major trading competitors for Germany are the U.S. and China. Uh, the U.S. and the Chinese currency tending to move hand in hand, and they need we. I think the world needs a, a lower euro, even if it doesn't implode. I think in general, you, most people would agree a lower euro is going to tend to provide a little relief for the zone, and this is what this valuation squeeze refers to. So let me get to uh, the current account. just want to make a couple of points on the current account. And, and the current account's a tough thing to use to trade on, and I don't think it's anything you can use um, with any relevant time frame uh, as a trading indicator. But it does give you an idea of just global macro things going on in the world, and I think from, from those we can take away a take we can have a lot of takeaway from it if we keep an eye on the current account. Just want to show you an example of this type of analysis. This, is, this black line is the U.S. current account deficit, um, and as you can see, here's zero, and everything else here is negative. On a this is a quarterly basis, um, and, and just showing, you know, the first time we, you know, we started to see the current account start to deteriorate. Um, in the 80s, um, going negative in here, and then we had <clears throat> then we had something called the U.S. stock market crash, 1987. Uh, those of you that may have been around or maybe remember that, um, it was later followed, 19, you know, by by a uh, recession uh, in the U.S., kind of the key to triggering a recession in 1990. Um, we also saw at the same time the popping of the Japanese bubble, and this was the beginning, actually, right in here, in 1990, of a 10 year bull market in the U.S. dollar. It changed the dynamics in a big way for the dollar uh, in that Japan was kind of taken out of the picture and capital was flowing back to the U.S. again. Um, and a, <clears throat> so, plus the bear market we had in the U.S. dollar prior to that made the U.S. assets relatively cheap. But this big risk bid that, again, we saw on the dollar um, uh, triggered by um, this improvement in the current account deficit um, was a big driver. Now, this improvement in the current account deficit, the reason it impacted Japan so much, there are a couple reasons. Uh, number one, um, whenever we see an improvement in the current account deficit, think of it as dollar-based credit coming out of the world. Remember what we said, when, when the dollar took over the position of the world reserve currency um, and took over gold's role, the dollar has to be that liquidity tool um, so whenever the current account deficit deteriorates, it means there's more dollar credit in, in the world. And whenever it improves, this line going up, it means there's dollar credit coming out of the world. That can come from either just money and deleveraging or, and or it can come from consumers that aren't buying as much anymore that are getting scared and taking. And when that happens, um, those, ex, those countries that are tied so closely and tightly to exports and the U.S. consumer – that, that demand that dollar credit and demand that purchasing of their goods, when we, when we see an improvement, it often has coincided with a major conflagration um, you know, in global markets, and this is an example right here. Thank you for listening to our podcast.
please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.